All right, and uh, welcome back to Better Understanding the Bible. I'm your host, Dallas, and today we have a real treat uh, joining us uh, because as we have been doing in the series of bringing forward conversation concerning the not so mainstream, but giving a voice to those perspectives and in conjunction with the theme of our channel being highly uh, focused on Genesis and especially through the uh, audience relevancy of the ancient Near East, we have an extremely awesome uh, conversation ahead of us here because we've been uh, joined by John H. Walton, or I'm going to call uh, John Walton the H trips me up a little bit, but uh, John, if you're unfamiliar with him, has spent 40 years as a professor. He has earned the title scholar. He's, uh, I think it's Zondervan, is that correct, that you've done the uh, commentaries under? Uh, I did a commentary with Zondervan, but I've done the whole Lost World series with InterVarsity. Yes, and it was um, the Bible Moody Institute for 20 years, and you're now currently at, um, oh, the name just slipped my mind. Wheaton College. Thank you very much. And so uh, as we see with uh, John, 40 years working in depth, most of those people who have heard of John have his books a little bit. Those of you who haven't, uh, we've already discussed a lot of stuff concerning introductory things to Genesis. So we're going to allow John to speak a, a little bit more in depth of those kind of things. So before I start uh, badgering John with question after question, uh, I want to again thank you so much for taking time out of uh, your week to join us and to spread some of this awesome uh, digging. You've spent 40 years in uh, the, the whole research project. You've gone down the vein that we're all interested in. So I would, uh, again, thank you so much. We all here that know of you appreciate what you have done and look forward to what information you've decided to share with us today. Well, thank you, Dallas, and thanks for inviting me on. It's a great opportunity just to share information with folks who are interested in it. So that's what I'd like to spend our time talking about. Absolutely. And I just want to let the people uh, know listening, uh, you guys know as well as I do that we're we're a small group of people that love this dig into Genesis. And I reached out to John on a whim, just a hope and a dream that, you know, he's built himself, you know, into something that is respectable. I reached out to him and he just said, yeah, he loves it just like we do and you know i just want to share that heart with people because that's why we're here we've had to stop and ask some hard questions but it's also opened up our mind to a much deeper and broader understanding of the book of genesis and in the midst of that we've uh, gone into some things that i've noticed you've spoken about heavily so things like the suzerain vassal treaty covenant hittite system uh, you've also weighed in heavily on job uh primarily uh we focused on genesis so you've obviously done some uh the bulk of your work, like you said, through the book, you know, The Lost World of Genesis. So before I start asking you questions, what are you at this point, 40 years into, where are you currently excited in your research? Well, I just turned in a manuscript to, uh, to IVP um, called Advances in the Lost World of Genesis. It's not a revised edition. It's rather bringing the conversation up to date. The first Lost World book was published 15 years ago. And since I speak on this stuff all the time, there are always new insights, new, new ideas of how to word things, new terminology, new resources, new questions. And uh, so this book will bring that whole conversation up to date uh, with all of those issues. It also features about 60 FAQs uh, because, again, since I speak in lots of uh, contexts, I, I get questions from people. I get questions from reviewers, I get questions from students, I get questions from everybody, and they tend to, to track in certain categories. So uh, I figured it was a good thing to try to answer some of those questions um, in a focused sort of way. So that book's coming out um, probably in about a year. I'm very excited about it uh, because uh, there's there's a lot that's happened in the 15 years. The other thing that I'm working on right now is that uh, a uh, co-author and I are working on a commentary on Daniel, and it's a two-volume commentary in Erdman's NICOT series. And we, I'm just even before I got on the podcast here, I'm editing through volume one and ready to um, editing what the editor has sent back. So we're we're moving well along on volume one, volume two. We hope to submit in a couple of months. And so we've got um, a, a very substantial 
commentary on Daniel coming out. That's actually really cool. That's exciting because uh, me personally, and that we've just been moving through Daniel and we've come to realize again, as you grow and come to understand and you start applying those new, uh, the, the near Eastern viewpoints and the cultural all of a sudden. So yeah, I'm actually quite excited now. So thank you for uh, giving that a little bit of a teaser. That's great. Sure. In the breadth of that, one thing that I wouldn't mind you speaking to is because that is a big deal, is if you wouldn't mind speaking to the importance of how the Bible started as compared to as we see getting down into Daniel, which was more literature based. I've heard you speak towards, and I think it's a really good point, how Genesis, when it started, was more based upon hearing as the means to transfer. And as a result of that, its literature was written differently because it's not intended to be done through a written manner. And I found that uh, very interesting. If you wouldn't mind speaking to that, I think that would be a very good thing to uh, launch us off. Sure. So in the second Lost World book, it was called Lost World of Scripture. And I did it with Brent Sandy. He's a New Testament scholar. So I did the Old Testament stuff. He did the New Testament stuff. And one of the things that we really wanted readers to understand was the fact that in the ancient world, we have hearing dominant cultures not text dominant cultures. And what that means is that um, they did not have an, an automatic impulse to write things. Uh, certain things were written down, often business documents or political documents uh, for record keeping, but generally lots of the traditions uh, that were circulating in the culture uh, were not written down. They were passed along orally from generation to generation. Uh, even if uh, some documents would have been written down, those documents would have been written by scribes and put in a, an archive, and most people were not able to read, not able to write, and even if they were, they didn't necessarily have access to the archive. So most of, most of scripture uh, came through a process of oral transmission uh, in a hearing-dominant culture. Uh, for us, we might think oral transmission is suspect because, you know, we, we play the old game telephone and we find out how things can deteriorate as they're passed down the line. But in a culture that's uh, set up to operate that way, uh, there's a little more confidence that we can have uh, that they really cared about transmitting things uh, in accurate ways. The the upshot of this, and I don't want to go into too much detail, but the upshot of it is that most of our Old Testament books did not begin as books. They did not begin with people writing a book. You know, I'm going to sit down and write whatever. Um, generally, instead, and in contrast, book is the last step in the process, not the first step in the process. So even though a book of the Bible might represent an early setting, like Genesis does, that doesn't mean it was written down early. It might have been written down again very late in the Old Testament period, but likewise that doesn't mean that it is therefore suspect. Uh, rather, it has preserved those traditions, uh, I believe authentically, accurately, uh, but yet they are stories being told, and they're stories being told with a purpose and the one telling the story is the one compiling the final work. So he's using traditions that have always been floating around for hundreds of years, but he gives it shape and purpose. And it's that writing, which is what we typically identify as being inspired and carrying authority. And therefore, um, we don't necessarily need to reconstruct the oral layers because what carries the authority of God is that written work, which is the book, which comes at the end of the process. That's awesome. So because when we're talking about uh, it's that process that reminds me of the how when we're looking at actually the beginning of the Bible and it coming together, we're seeing Moses is bringing Egypt out and we're actually seeing, it makes sense logically that they're building a story just through this, uh, this travel that they have to go through, these events that are taking place. So then that leads me to the next question, which is gonna be along the lines of, uh, and I've heard you teach upon how 
Moses isn't credited, and I would tend to agree anywhere as writing the entire five books of the Torah. Mm -hmm. So I wondered at this point, after all your study, if you wouldn't mind sharing your position on how the Pentateuch uh, did come together. Uh, I've heard all the way from tablet theory all the way to, yeah, Moses sat down and wrote the whole thing. So interestingly, uh, wondering where you fall in that gambit. Well, there are certain places in Deuteronomy where it indicates that God, uh, God instructs Moses to write this down, and it says Moses wrote this down. Uh, I, I accept that at face value, that that's what happened. But that's only some very little parts of it. Uh, and so the things the text says Moses wrote down, I'm willing to credit that. Uh, when we get to later statements about the law of Moses and things that seem to refer to a larger literary piece, um, again, we don't know if that's circulating orally or in written form. Uh, we also don't know what parts of it it's talking about. And so in that sense, we have to claim ignorance to some extent, just because we don't want to misrepresent something. Uh, and so to that extent, Moses uh, would certainly be a logical person to connect with these traditions. But that still doesn't tell us exactly what his role is. So I don't tend to think in terms of authors. I tend to think in terms of traditions that eventually are recorded by scribes and that at the end of the process are put together by compilers. And what those compilers do is what becomes scripture to us and is indicated as having authority. What's your opinion on the idea of, uh, I think the, it's, it's the mainstream view now, it's the word becoming, that uh, there's different, obviously different parts of Genesis that have seemed to be pushed together, written by different groups like a religious sect versus uh, more of a historical view. Uh, I was wondering if you have an opinion on that or if that's just something that doesn't enter into where you're coming from. Uh, it really doesn't enter in. Uh, I do have opinions of it as well. Uh, <laughs> you know, if, if, if the end result that we have is the work of compilers, then it's certainly possible that they could use some sources. Um, those sources might be things like oral tradition and um, scattered documents. Uh, I tend to think of those kinds of sources rather than a literary source. Uh, the standard uh, position out there will talk about a priestly source. And it's a whole, already it's assumed to be a whole literary piece. And I'm, I'm not sure that I'm ready to see whole literary pieces uh, that early in the process. So um, they, that there could be sources fine. I mean, the idea that the final work is a compiler leaves that possibility open. But whether we know those sources, know who did them, know when they were done, know their purposes, we're speculating because we just don't have any of that material. I think that's a fair answer. And I, I think it's safe because, you know, it's, it's always good to not go beyond what we have. And I don't think, and I agree with you, that we have that position yet, that we're allowed to to just assume that completeness. I think that's a, a good point. I'm interested so, in the authority of the work that we do have. And that authority is vested in the written documents. That's what Paul tells us, graphe. It's in the written documents. And therefore, the one who wrote it, the compiler, is carrying the authority. And so I don't have to somehow support its authority by tracing back along the line of what we don't have and what came before that compiler. It's a compiler that has authority because the compiler has added his arrangement, his purposes, and that's what we have to pay attention to. So we don't have to reconstruct the events in order to gain the narrator's interpretation of the events. And the narrator's inspired, you know, the product that he produces is inspired. And so that's what we're interested in. It's always nice to kind of reconstruct events, but that's it's not essential for us to do so. Um, it might be a great thing to try to prove that these people really existed. Great, they really existed. That doesn't help me get to scripture's purpose and message because that's coming through the compiler. One thing that I like to say is that it's not the characters that we find in narrative, who deliver the message. It's the narrator who delivers the message. 
and we have to pay less attention to the characters. Oh, what were they thinking? And more attention to the narrator. What is he writing? <laughs> I think it's also uh, interestingly validated as well by the New Testament authors who didn't take issue up with it. If they, as you said, you know, we have this authority, they didn't seem to, at least in the New Testament writings that I've seen, question whether or not they should be going along with the narrative created by that author to break that down. So I think that also supports, you know, yeah, let's stick to what this message is behind this, as opposed to trying to rip it apart to that degree. So that's, that's an interesting point. I, I can appreciate that as well. So I want to move this then a little bit forward as we progress kind of Genesis appearing in the midst of this coming together. Somehow we're, there's a merging in today's modern mind that that coming together was the universe materially. Uh, and I've heard on the other side all the way to that's just referring then to the beginning of just Israel being formed and giving order. So I'm wondering in your position, because we are talking about it came together, obviously, when Moses brought them before the mountain, and that's when the, the covenant was ratified. So then it must have been written that after that point. So it does make sense. It could be reflective of Israel's creation. But the language of it today, we assume, is cosmology. So if you wouldn't mind uh, bridging the gap in between that rather large space about where you uh, put yourself. Right. So uh, certainly Israel would have read themselves into the story, but I don't see any indications that they saw it as their story. And again, for things like that, I want text to support me and I don't see it. As a matter of fact, it's it's strikingly shocking that once you get past Genesis 11, the Old Testament almost never comes back to Genesis 1 through 11. Almost nothing in Genesis 1 through 11 is referred to in the rest of the Old Testament. And that includes the Tower of Babel. It includes the flood. It includes Cain and Abel. It includes the garden and the tree. Um, they do talk about a tree of life in passing in Proverbs. Uh, they don't talk about Adam and Eve. Adam is only in the genealogy of First Chronicles. And obviously that's just in passing. So none of the things in Genesis 1 through 11 seem to have been very central in how Israel thought about itself. When Israel wants to talk about sin, they don't go back to the garden. They talk about their violations of the covenant. And so it's, it's very interesting uh, to think in those terms. Uh, if this was written, Genesis 1, uh, written for Israel to sort of metaphorically talk about its origins, it certainly doesn't give you that hint in Genesis 1, and it doesn't give you anything in the rest of the Old Testament. So then I'm flying on my imagination, which I'm typically very reticent to do, because I'm interested in what has authority, not what sounds like really cool stuff. So those are kind of my thoughts. So then when we're approaching the beginning of Israel, and you see the because uh, obviously there's lots of debate upon the, the order in which the the five books are put in and all that kind of stuff. But that set aside uh, for those, because like I said, about 35 percent of my audience will definitely be familiar with where you're coming from. Then if we can use that as a, a springboard into. So then how do you see the unfolding of Genesis one? Sure. So the the operative question and the one that often is not asked uh, is what kind of creation account is this? Okay, you've mentioned two kinds. One kind being it's a creation account that's um, sort of a metaphor for the origins of Israel. And again, I've already addressed that because I don't see the evidence for that in anywhere in the Old Testament. Uh, the other is that what kind of a creation account is it? It's a material creation account. And that really comes out of our own uh, way of thinking, our own modern viewpoint, which tends to look at things scientifically and materially and those kinds of things. But we can't assume either of those, okay? Uh, we have to let the text speak for itself. And that's why I offer a third option. Uh, when I first wrote about it in The Lost World of Genesis 1, I talked about it as a functional approach, uh, that God was bringing about functions. And frankly, I quickly discovered that that was confusing a lot of people. 
<laughs> lots of the reviews uh, really jumped all over that and it was very clear in how they tried to talk about it that they didn't understand what i was saying you know to some extent my bad but the yeah, it's a very was, different term you would otherwise at that point ever be uh you know, used to being thrown at genesis one so yeah very different <laughs> yeah. so people struggled with it and the critics struggled with it and uh, yet other people seem to get it perfectly fine um, but the, I had chosen that term function um, just because I couldn't think of a better one. I wanted to give some kind of contrast to material, but and that's the best I could come up with. But even then, I talked about the functional approach as meaning that it that whatever was being created was being given a role and a purpose in an ordered system. And so I tried to explain it in that way. Now, in the meantime, uh, I've I've landed on a word that has worked much better and it's already there in that little definition i gave and that is god is bringing order god as creator is the order bringer uh, order is arguably the highest value in the ancient world and so to bring order is a very important exercise and so i would see god as creating by bringing order uh, and that's something that you find in almost every cosmology account in the ancient world. Uh, but lots of those accounts mix together the cosmos and society because you want order in both cosmos and society. So and, here we're obviously not just talking about where the stars are supposed to be, but we're right. talking about like authority and systems and stuff. Things working the way they're supposed to work. Okay. And again, there you can see function sitting behind that as well. <laughs> yeah. So it's not like I've changed my view. It's just that the term order works better. And so God was bringing about order. And you can see that in the seven days and the things that they talk about. But he's also designating people as order bringers alongside of him. The subjugate and rule line uh, in day six. And so that brings those two together. Uh, the idea that when God rests on his throne, uh, he is ruling now over this ordered world. And so order makes it work a whole lot better. I wish I had thought of that from the very start. <laughs> Again, I had it there, but it was buried in the definition <laughs> of function. And uh, I think this works a whole lot better. But in, in that context, when I ask what kind of creation account is this, my answer is it's an order bringing account which i contend is the highest level of creation in the ancient world uh, they didn't care so much about the material world they were aware of it an example i use is uh, our computers you know when you talk about your computer do you talk about the chips or the apps <laughs> yeah. what's more important to you you know there's chips in there but you don't know anything about them <laughs> you just know they're there and they kind of make it work and you're much more interested in your apps because that's how your computer world is ordered and so that's been a helpful analogy i think another analogy that i use is the distinction between house and home building that's a house interesting because i was just with that place. last example it was right. the engineer and then the part the people who get to use what the engineer made yeah yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to no, make that, sure I'm hearing that. Yeah, yeah. So the you know, you you can talk about your house, the foundation and the roof and the plumbing and the electricity, and they're all very important. But um, building a house is different from making a home. And when you make a home, you figure out what room's going to be what, how you're going to organize the furniture, what you're going to put in the closets, and and that's an ordering, organizing function process. And that also is a creation process. So if we ask the question, what kind of creation account is this? And again, we don't just get to pick the one we like best. We have to go back to the text and say, what kinds of things is the text doing? How is it couching its material? Uh, and I've tried to build a case that, that it is the ordering, uh, things like time. I mean, time is not material. And so, you know, that's that's an ordering issue. Uh, even when it talks about the sun, moon, and stars, number one, Israel didn't know they were material. That's why they call them lights, because they don't know that they're objects. 
And so God made lights. They don't see that as God making objects. But even then, the text quickly moves to for sign seasons, days, and years. That is how those heavenly bodies that we call objects are ordering their world. And so, again, I think this is just a matter of following the text instead of imposing our preconceptions from our materially oriented world on it. So then how would you see the overlap uh, between the first three days over the next three days? Because they do seem to duplicate. And from your perspective, what would the purpose be behind uh, the double ordering then of the, what seems to be anyway at first glance the same things? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's part of the literary structure. Day one, day four, day two, day five, the literary structure is there. I think it's more than a literary structure, but the literary structure is undoubtedly there. Uh, but I talked about it as, in my initial work, as functions versus functionaries. Oh, uh, okay. But they, they all have to do with ordering. It's just at different levels of ordering. And you have kind of a first level of ordering in days one through three, and then sort of a second level of ordering. So for instance, I look at the birds and fish as more like furniture. This is the kind of how your word, world is populated and it, it operates in those spheres. So rather than God making objects, you'll notice there that with birds, fish, animals, it's populations. You know, it's, it, so again, it's not an object, it's a population, birds, fish. And I would contend that that's even the case with people that it's not really singling out two people. It's saying humanity is the image of God and comes in male and female varieties. That's how it's ordered. And so again, it's a population. It doesn't talk about two on day six. It doesn't even talk about their names, Adam and Eve. That's all a matter for other chapters. So, um, and that, of course, that's also interesting because that means that the image of God is something that's corporate, not individual. So I couldn't say, if this is right, I couldn't say, I am the image of God. No. Uh, humanity is the image of God. I contribute to it. I participate in it. I'm part of it. But I'm not the image of God. Likewise, this will help people, I think. I'm not the body of Christ. <laughs> body of Christ is corporate. I am part of it, I contribute to it, I participate in it, but I am not the body of Christ. I'm just a big toenail or something. You know, I, it's, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in that way, body of Christ and image of God are similar kinds of concepts operating on a corporate level, not an individual level. So then interestingly, how you take that then, how when we, cause this is something, honestly, I don't think I, off the top of my head, I've heard you speak to, when we transition then out of uh, the order system into Genesis 2, what are we seeing then from your perspective in the second account? Well, it turns its attention to terrestrial issues instead of cosmic issues. Um, notice that Genesis 1-2 starts with a deficiency. Uh, uh, it's, it's unordered, it's non-ordered, and it needs order. So it highlights that deficiency in verse two. When you get to the beginning of the second account, Genesis two, five and six, likewise indicates a deficiency. Now, not on the cosmic level, but on the terrestrial level. And so we get to this idea that there's deficiencies that need order bringing. And God is an order bringer and that's what he's doing. And so the, the lack of agriculture Agriculture is something that was looked upon as order bringing in the ancient world. And so it talks about that. It talks about civilization. Um, people are naked and unashamed. Um, well, we might look at that and think that that's a pre-fall positive, but I don't see it that way. The way those terms are used throughout the Bible and through the ancient Near East, we should do better to translate it they are indecent and shameless. They're lacking civilization. And order is going to move them in that direction. It's not good for man to be alone, another deficiency. By the way, that doesn't mean that it's perfectly fine for women to be alone. So <laughs> not good for man to be alone, that's talking humanity. 
and so a deficiency and it's um is remediated by providing family and community and so uh, we see that it's dealing with more of the society level issues agriculture civilization community those are society level order issues in contrast to the cosmic level order issues and that's how the two fit together that's why i don't follow the general stream of saying oh these are totally different sources they have nothing to do with one another they didn't even know about each other or something like that i think they're working hand in glove but working in two different contexts cosmic and terrestrial so could you almost say that genesis one is almost like because it's the cosmic view it's almost like a template in which then the terrestrial view is almost being duplicated and being explained through is that a safe way of explaining it um i would clarify it even further to say you know, the cosmic level one is saying that god is a god of order and he's creating order uh, on the cosmic level what does that mean for the terrestrial level okay so but there we're talking about how humanity seeks order genesis one is how god brings order two and following is how humanity seeks order and all of the ways that they bring up are ways that are well known in the ancient near east okay they would have viewed order as consisting of community and agriculture and civilization and city building and uh, all of those things and so in that sense the biblical narrator is in conversation with the world around him considering all of the different options that would have been familiar options in the world around to basically consider do these things bring ultimate order in the human terrestrial realm yes they do but not the full thing um, and so after looking at all of the deficiencies and how they're resolved how order is brought about still not quite not quite totally what they're looking for and of course what happens is genesis 1 through 11 dumps you into Genesis 12, where covenant is God's program, instrument, mechanism for establishing order in society that involves relationship with him, the covenant, involves presence where he dwells among them, and involves Torah, which is helping them to understand order on the social level. So it all holds together pretty well once you have that order piece in place. And that's something I, I, I've actually come to completely agree with you is at the end of the day, the goal and the purpose and the point of this was to describe God among men living and dwelling and benefiting from that relationship between the properly functioning people underneath the covenant with a proper ordered system by God. Mm -hmm. And so when I take a look at that, are you saying, so I guess my mind would be, because what I'm hearing is Genesis 1, we're, see, we're hearing the corporate man in the order of God. Genesis 2, the corporate body of the man of God. Does Adam then at some point become in Genesis 3 a human, or are you then still seeing him as a corporate body that progresses into the covenant people? My view of Adam is that he's an archetype for all humanity not just for israel um, adam and eve together are archetypal for all humanity archetypal means simply that what they represent for humanity is more important than who they might be individually it doesn't answer the question of individual historical kinds of things yay or nay all kinds of arguments but I'm more interested in what the text is doing with them because that's what carries authority. So that's what I want to know. And so I see the text presenting them as archetypes. Uh, that is, it is in their experiences to begin with that all of these questions about order in the human realm are raised. Um, so, Lots of this information about um, 
the terrestrial order and the quest for order, um, the inadequacy of some of the ways that they sought order. Lots of this has come together in my son's doctoral dissertation. So I'm very much influenced by his research on this, and I need to acknowledge that. Uh, one of the points that he brings up, and he's the one that's a co-author with me on several of my Lost World books. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. To be able to do something like that with your son must be very rewarding. That's, that's awesome. We've, we've written three books together, and it's been a blast. That's um, so cool. The But what he also brought up, and I think there's a great example, um, you know, in Ecclesiastes, what is it that the narrator is doing? He's taking you through several different um, ideas about what brings meaning to life. And he considers wealth and he considers pleasure and he considers wisdom and he considers family. He considers religion, uh, picks up all of these. And it's basically these are the usual suspects. You know, like in the detective things, round up the usual suspects. These are the usual suspects mm -hmm. in the ancient world for what brought meaning to life. And one by one, he disqualifies them, not because they're bad things or wrong things. Some of them are, uh, but that's not the basis for it. Some of them, it's that works fine till you die and then it doesn't work anymore. And mm -hmm. so it's this process of, of picking up one after the other, considering it and setting it aside. And so my son's suggestion is the same thing is happening in these early chapters of Genesis, picking up one after another of the candidates for what brings order and considering it, setting it aside, uh, and eventually to end up at the covenant, which is the order bringing mechanism uh, for, for society, for people. That's great. So... The reason why I want to bring that up is because you're not presenting either myth or literal. You're presenting as Paul would, I think it's in chapter five, where he references Adam and Jesus as being types off of even one another. So you're referencing it more as from the literary point of view and trying to find the importance into the message. Right. And the, the important pivot point there is that nothing Adam and Eve do is there to say something about them as individuals that makes them different from us. It's rather to portray them as all of us. Everything that they do, we do. And it's just by that kind of, this is humanity. This is what humanity does. And it's just bundled into those two characters not to try to say, and here's how they're different from the rest of us, or here's here's what they did, and we all got stuck with the results. <laughs> right? I have weeds because of these people. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> man. So, uh, so, but everything that they're doing is as archetypal characters to say, this is what we are. So we don't have to talk about how come Adam and Eve's sin got transferred to us. I don't deserve that. You know, how, how does it get passed down to us? That's not the point. Granted, theologians uh, further down the line were interested in those questions, but Genesis isn't interested in it and it doesn't address it because it doesn't have to get passed to us. It is us. It's what so we it do. really brings in the importance of really understanding more and more of the mind of the people who were alive at that time, because they were the ones who were trying to speak and understand this, like you said earlier, in stories to one another, not in documents for us to nitpick a character or a dot. So again, the narrator's not interested in us being able to reconstruct life in the garden or reconstruct Adam and Eve and what they were thinking. And what it, we don't have to reconstruct. We need to see what the narrator is doing. That's what carries the authority of God. Adam and Eve, as characters, do not carry the message. The narrator carries the message. That's great. So then, just for fun with this, because I know you've spoken on a lot of topics, if we just for fun rock this forward a little bit and go into a little bit of the uh, muddy waters, how then do you approach for the listeners? I, I've, I've heard you speak a little bit about this, so I, I got a little cheat on this. But 
then we have to move this forward to Genesis 6 and the sons of God and what's the happenings there. Because if we're not looking at it then as this battle between this group versus this group, but rather a narrative and a story, what are you then seeing and taking out of that? Okay, so we're still on the Genesis 1 through 11 thing. How can order be established in the world? And the Genesis narrator is in what I call cultural discourse with the world around him. There's a conversation going on. He's interacting with his world. In his world, one of the ways that they thought order was brought was by this group that was sent by the gods that is called the sons of gods that were supposed to bring the arts of civilization to humanity. We've got their stories in Babylonian records. Okay, they're called the Apkalu. And they're they're portrayed as the sons of a particular god and that was their job they failed in their job because they intermarried with human women we recognize the story in genesis 6. we don't have much of it in genesis 6 but we recognize the shape of it and so here in genesis 6 the narrator is again dealing with here's another thing that's out there in the ancient world that talks about how order is established or how order fails. And he's giving you that account. So again, we don't have to reconstruct the account. Were these sons of God actually, what, gods, fallen gods, fallen angels, demons? And of course, trying to define the Nephilim comes out of all of that. We don't have to reconstruct it we have to recognize it as one of the ways that people were considering that order came about and it was a failed attempt regardless how you reconstruct it or determine the historicity of of those characters so then carrying that forward to babel because and i think a lot of uh, scholars do this they say that Babel is a duplication of what we're seeing story-wise in Genesis 6. But you put an interesting twist on it that I, I really haven't heard anyone say, which is you don't say they were trying to build a tower up to God. You say the idea opposite was about bringing them down. So if you can bring that story and that purpose, why would that ordering be different? Because obviously the, the Eden destruction is the tearing down. So that, what are we seeing going on with Babel? Well, here we find that instead of the sons of God, whoever they are, being sent as emissaries from the gods to try to help people find order, people have their own idea. They want to bring God down himself, not an emissary. They want to provide a mechanism. That's the tower. We know about ziggurats. We know what they were for. We have plenty of texts on that. They want to provide a tower for the God to come down. And the God will come down and he will come into his temple because the ziggurats were built next to temples and there he would be worshipped. And so they're trying to kind of bypass the emissary and get to the God himself. And so they see that as potentially order bringing. We see that in the idea that they want to make a name for themselves. Making a name for yourself is part of order bringing. And you could do that in lots of good and positive ways. Even having children was a way of making a name for yourself. Anything by which you would be remembered and that there are lines of connectivity and continuity, generation to generation, these are things that are order bringing. But they also believed that they would make a name for themselves because if you've got a God who is hmm, dependent on you, right? They believed in the ancient world, not Israel. In the ancient world, they believed gods had needs. And the worship in the temple was to provide for their needs. So they're trying to invite a god down, build a temple, tower, um, build a tower, invite the god down, invite him into this temple, and boy, will we take care of him. We will provide everything that he needs. And that means that he's, he's going to become dependent on us. And next thing you know, We've got a God in our pocket. We can accomplish great things. We can be prosperous and we can be wealthy and we can, et cetera, et cetera. And so- That's that generic idea of throwing the virgin into the volcano kind of idea, right? If you meet a need of the God, yep. So in, in that sense, this is yet another 
order bringing attempt by the people because they think that the results of this will be very positive in their favor. But again, nope. Getting God to come down, you know, uh, coercing or inviting or manipulating God to come down and bring benefits for you, that's not how it works. And that's why Genesis 11 pops us right across to Genesis 12, where God says, I'm going to do this on my own terms. And it starts with relationship, not with benefits. Now, God mentioned some benefits, land, family, right? But those are things that the Israelites stand to gain, but their purpose is through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And that comes about when God comes to dwell among them on his terms, not on theirs, not to meet his needs, but rather he's going to meet their needs without being mutually dependent on them. So all of those kinds of things open up. These are the kinds of things that we can learn more about by learning about the ancient Near East. And that's why I put so much emphasis on that. So then in your opinion, because to me, it, it seems like when we jump from Genesis to Exodus, uh, the story really becomes very different, more detailed, more intricate. Uh, when we're moving from Genesis to Exodus, uh, that aligns kind of with what you're talking about as another phase, right? We're moving into it. What is happening when we see that literary change? I'd be very interested to hear your opinion on that. Sure. Well, you know, it's moving from Abraham's family sons, grandsons, great-grandsons, right, as a family, now to a nation. And so you get Genesis, I'm sorry, Exodus 6. And now Israel, as the nation, is going to be God's people. And so the covenant takes a quantum leap, in, so to speak. But also that picks up the things that Genesis left pieces hanging, threads hanging. You know, they weren't in the land. As a matter of fact, they were in Egypt. And so that was a dangling thread. And um, they did not yet have God's presence among them. If the relationship set up in Genesis was meant to eventuate in presence, well, you don't get to that till the end of Exodus, where now God comes down to dwell in the tabernacle. So in that sense, Exodus is picking up the loose threads from the narrative in Genesis. Um, and showing you sort of how those things come together. Now, obviously, Exodus was, of course, written after the Exodus because you wouldn't really stop to write that during it. So is that then to be read in the same vein as Genesis through the uh, function and ordering perspective? Or are we now starting to change perspectives into natural, into that terrestrial view? Like, where are you seeing that? Well, again, the Exodus introduces Torah and the Ten Commandments and uh, the Book of the Covenant and the, the Torah issues. And those Torah has the very purpose of bringing about order among, now not on the broader terrestrial scale, not everybody, but now for Israel specifically, God's going to work through Israel to bring about order. And then through them, all the families of the earth will be blessed as order, ideally, presumably, uh, is, is extended. So I'd be hard pressed at this point to take all that idea and understanding that you've applied in Genesis to not bring up Revelation 21 with obviously massive allusions back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3. What are we seeing then as that, obviously, if we're going to change our perspective of Genesis 1 so radically and look at it as more of that Eastern mindset, what is John presenting? Because he's obviously using the same language going forward, in your opinion. Right. And so he's picking up the covenant language. Uh, we, uh, we don't find that so much in Genesis and by covenant language here, I'm referring to the line that's quoted in those opening verses of Revelation 21, that, you know, um, I will be your God and you will be my people. I will walk among them and be with them. Uh, I call that Emmanuel theology. Emmanuel theology, God with us. And it's articulated in the covenant with that recurring idea that 
I will be their God and they will be my people and I will be with them. So, uh, but you don't get that language in Genesis. Uh, you could certainly see some of those ideas that are hinted at, but you don't get the language. Yeah, I think the closest is God walking in the garden with Adam specifically, right? Maybe. Oh. <laughs> the, the problem is we don't know if that was a regular occurrence. We only know that it happened once and it wasn't a friendly, fun moment. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I don't want to extrapolate that um, without, yeah. No, that's fair because it does also bring a, a parousia type application as well, not just a hangout and socialize application. I think that's very fair. So then so, going back to Revelation 21. Right. So Revelation 21, uh, again, the, the capstone of Emmanuel theology, where God says, I will be with you and I will, and I will dwell among you and you will be my people. I will be your God. And so that brings that conclusion to that covenant language. Again, one of the first places you find it is in Leviticus 26. Uh, it's picked up in Solomon's prayer, dedicatory prayer for the temple in 1 Kings 8. Uh, it shows up in Ezekiel 34 uh, when, and they keep reiterating that same, same phrase all the way through. And so in that sense, um, Revelation 21 is picking up the theme. Of course, by that time, it's been enhanced. It's been enhanced by the incarnation where uh, Christ, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And it's been enhanced at Pentecost, uh, where we have a reiteration of the Tower of Babel, where God does come down and he does dwell among them, dwell in them. And so you get to that idea again. Um, Paul picks it up when he indicates that we are the temple and he quotes that verse again of that um, I will be their God, they will be my people and I'll be with them. So Revelation 21 is just tying up all of those things into the new heavens and new earth, that those are the things that will characterize it. And those have been the key issues all, all along since the beginning. So then it would almost be from your perspective, uh, very unfamiliar to not mention that as they're continuing that same idea and it would almost betray them not to bring it up i guess i would agree with that it's it's very sensible <laughs> not trying to put or, words into yeah, your mouth there but just a neat no, thought that popped in my I, head i, mean, I don't, don't want to i wouldn't want to condemn their neglect if they did it, but <laughs> they didn't so no, and we can see that immediately, right, with all throughout the uh, New Testament language of a new creation motif as well. So mm -hmm. absolutely. We are uh, coming uh, closer to the end here. We only have a few minutes left. Uh, before I ask you to uh, plug away so people can find the interesting stuff that you've discovered throughout, what would you want to just suggest to people to give them an idea because like obviously we're here at this channel because we've started questioning genesis we've started questioning this also from a more mature trying to find out you know a lot of the group here are a little bit older so we, we're, we've run a little bit of that you know first love charm out and now we want that deeper relationship so if you could speak to what would you want us maturing and growing into this to take away from what you've discovered well, all of what I'm doing, even though it's sort of non-traditional interpretations or new insights into text, they're all based on a, a very deep quest in my life and in my heart to try to understand the authority of Scripture. And to me, that's tied into the author's intentions and therefore requires us to think deeply about culture and about genre and about the meanings of words and all of those things that I bring to my study. So I would be encouraging people that they ought to, th ought to think very carefully about how they understand the authority of scripture. Because lots of people embrace authority, but they don't really know how they define that. Uh, so for instance, you could answer the question, the Bible has authority to what? How do you finish the sentence. And people can ask themselves that. Some people might say the Bible has authority to tell me what to do. The Bible has authority to give me doctrine. The Bible has authority to point me to Christ. 
there are any number of different ways that people could think about it. Um, but lots of those, while certainly parts of the Bible do those things, you can't really see the whole Bible as doing that. And so I would encourage people to think deeply about what their model of authority is. What does the Bible have authority to do? And my answer to that is the Bible's authority is vested in the author's intention. So my job to understand authority is to try to understand the author's intentions, uh, which sometimes might tell you something to do. Sometimes it might point you to Christ. Sometimes it might give you doctrine, but lots of times it won't. Whatever it's doing, I want to be tracking with the authors. And that dictates my methodology. That dictates how I'm going to identify authoritative meaning in the text that makes it God's word and not just mine or somebody else's. And so I would encourage people to think deeply about that because that's where all the cultural background comes in. I think that's perfect. And I, I can't reiterate that enough. And that's why part of this channel is existing. And I'm so glad that you've already presented uh, a lot of this information that can help us get back to what's actually taking place from their view so that we not necessarily can join a religion or do anything, but just so that we ourselves can make better decisions in our day to day lives about our family and the people we care about. So before I let you go here, I do want to let you uh, plug away so people can find your work. Where would be the best place? I, I just dropped your name in and bookstores all over seem to be carrying you. So unless there's some special place or anything that you want, uh, feel free, John. Well, there's no particular place. You can get them wherever books are sold kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, I've done a variety of things. You, I mean, I've, I've got a book on uh, oh yeah, ancient years and thought in the Old Testament which will open up the ancient Near East for people. Of course, I have the Lost World series. It's just one of the volumes. Uh, and there are seven now in the series with number eight at the publisher coming soon. Um, there's also a book that I did recently called Wisdom for Faithful Reading. And, you know, if people want to get started with some of the things I've written, that's probably one of the best places to start because that lays out my methodology uh, for trying to read the Old Testament well. Just a small Can you say the name of that, of that again? A wisdom for Faithful Reading. Subtitle is Principles and Practices for Old Testament Interpretation. So that might be a good place to start. If people are dealing with um, uh, curriculum or Bible stories in that way, my wife and I did a book called The Bible Story Handbook. And that goes through 175 stories and it tries to suggest in each one just it doesn't tell the story just what do we do with this story <laughs> what's <laughs> what's the focus of it what should the application be uh, what should we not do with it um, what are some you know how do we understand how this story fits in its context those kinds of questions so people who, especially people who work with sunday school curriculum uh, might be very interested in in that kind of uh, approach so those are some of the things. Of course, I should mention the Cultural Background Study Bible, which I was an editor on uh, for the Old Testament. Craig Keener was the editor for the New Testament. And that's a study Bible available in NIV, NRSV, and NKJV. It's a study Bible where all the notes have to do with cultural background. They don't have to do with application. They don't have to do with theology. They don't have to do with all the wonderful things that other study Bibles do. This study Bible is particularly doing the cultural backgrounds. And, uh, and what's the name of that one again? That's the Cultural Background Study Bible. Perfect. Well, I do want to thank you so much for taking this time. Uh, I said earlier that, uh, you know, you're, you do this once a week. Well, for us here on this channel, this is quite a treat. So, you know, I appreciate you taking that time, sitting down. Hopefully with this, people will share this out, get some of that information out. And uh, we just keep working at this. And I think as through time, God and his greatness is going to reveal more and more so that we as just the body of people in general interested in this stuff will get a clearer view. And I do believe that you're absolutely one of those parts that have helped uh, make that come to be. And hopefully through this video, you guys listening will take this, think about the things John has presented, maybe grab some of his material and use that to 
better understand the Bible. Ha, got it in there. So <laughs> perfect. I'll plug my own channel once in a while, I guess. Thank you guys for everyone uh, taking time to listen. Uh, until next time, uh, wherever you are, I hope this finds you well and God bless.